Um, welcome William Beaudry, who needs no introduction because he's such an integral part of our adult forum committee and forums here on a regular basis. But William has served for the last year as our diocesan bicentennial missioner and uh, has been encouraging us to do things like name our 200s and other things throughout the year. And that will all culminate next weekend when the Diocese of Ohio holds its uh, 200th annual convention. And so uh, we hope that uh, this presentation will whet your appetite for that. Uh, there will be a convention Eucharist next Saturday afternoon at which the presiding bishop will be preaching, Michael Curry. And there will also be activities next Sunday at Bellwether Farm, the new camp and conference center of the diocese. But William will tell us more, I'm sure. So William, let us welcome you. Thank you. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, Rich, and good morning, everybody. I was asked to talk this morning about the intertwined tales of St. Paul's and the Episcopal Diocese of Ohio. As Rich said, as readers of parish notes and church life know, or as you may have noticed from the banner out, front, out in front of the church, <laughs> hard to miss, the diocese is in fact turning 200 this year. Thanks be to God. Can I get an amen? <laughs> amen. All right. There were Episcopalians in Ohio even before there was a state of that name. In 1789, Colonel Ebenezer Battelle, who unfortunately no image remains of him, read Episcopal prayer book services at the fortified Campus Martius in Marietta, in what was then the Ohio Territory. These were the earliest known Episcopal services in the region, just two years after the framers gathered in Philadelphia to draft the U.S. Constitution. In 1792, regular services were held in Cincinnati by the Reverend Jackson Kemper. Four years later, the Reverend Dr. Joseph Doddridge and his wife Mary Wells held monthly worship services in private homes in Steubenville. In 1797, I should use the mic. In 1797, the Reverend Seth Hart arrived in Cleveland and conducted the first worship services. The town had been founded just the year before. It was not easy work. One early horseback missionary from Pennsylvania, the Reverend Joseph Budger, Badger, complained that the people in this territory have no apparent piety. <laughs> they seem to glory in their infidelity. <laughs> Religion was for many the subject of coarse jesting, noted a St. Paul's historian, the Reverend Tony Jarvis, including an early account of a public whiskey-fueled parody of The Last Supper. <laughs> we don't do that much anymore. <laughs> Other Episcopalians arrived in Ohio in 1803 from Hartford, Connecticut, and Hampshire, Massachusetts, and settled in Worthington, Ohio. Among their number was the Reverend Deacon James Kilborn. who conducted the first worship services in the town schoolhouse. That year, Congress made Ohio the 17th state to join the Union. In coming years, there were Episcopal divine services in homes, schoolhouses, and even a Lorain County blacksmith shop. We don't do that much anymore either. The first organized Episcopal parishes in Ohio were St. John's Worthington. The glories of technology. Point this way. Closer to the door. There we go. St. John's Worthington and Parts Adjacent, as it was termed, which was organized in 1804, and St. James Borden in 1809. The first parish in Cleveland, any guesses? St. John's. Not St. Paul's. St. John's. Dennis knows. It was Trinity. Oh, true. Founded in November 1816 in the corner of St. Clair and Seneca, what is now West 3rd Street. On May, 27, eight, on May 22nd, 1817, the House of Bishops of the Episcopal Church, meeting a general convention at Trinity Church, New York, known to many fans of Hamilton as the uh, burial site of Alexander Hamilton, adopted a resolution allowing a red diocese to be formed and a bishop elected in Ohio. We were the first Episcopal diocese formed outside of the original 13 colonies. On June 3rd, 1818, at a special convention in Worthington, the Reverend Philander Chase, who had been, we'll get to that, who had been an itinerant and very hardworking priest in the state for several years, was almost unanimously elected Bishop of Ohio. He didn't cast a vote for himself, 
so it wasn't unanimous. <laughs> Chase was described by St. Paul's Secretary Lydia, e, Lydia F. Perkins in a 1918 history as being a man of, quote, intense feeling, marvelous powers of endurance, unusual pertinacity, and great impatience of opposition. Which is another way of saying he could be a pain in the ass if he had <laughs> A master builder of the Church of God. A good description, I think, for any good bishop. He would go on to found... Kenyon College. Kenyon College. Find the hill and set a prayer. And also Bexley Hill Seminary. On February 4, 1819, Chase was consecrated Bishop of Ohio at St. James Church, Philadelphia, by the then presiding bishop, William White. We've since been led by ten other bishops. The Episcopal, Episcopal Church in Ohio split into two dioceses in 1875, with the 44 counties in northern Ohio retaining the name... Diocese of Ohio. Diocese of Ohio. And the 44 in southern Ohio taking the name... Southern, southern Ohio. Southern Ohio. <laughs> Hard to figure out, but that's what they did. <laughs> and one of St. Paul's. Our church was originally formed by 45 gentlemen from Trinity and Grace Parishes in Cleveland on October 26, 1846. This would be 43 years after statehood. The church fathers, there were, I'm sorry to say, no church mothers then, at least not on paper, met in an upper room of the American House, a downtown hotel, drew up articles of association and pledged a whopping $937 for the establishment of a new parish. It was good money back in those days. The Reverend Dr. Gideon Babcock Perry, a former Baptist minister then in Philadelphia, was called to be St. Paul's first rector. And he was offered the princely salary of $1,000 a year. Wow. And room and board, quote, not to exceed $3.50 a week. <laughs> Unquote. Penny pitching, even then. <laughs> Babcock came recommended by Bishop Charles P. McElvain, a prominent Episcopal, Episcopal leader nationally, who would later be sent, as it happens, by President Lincoln to woo British leaders to the federal cause during the Civil War. A recent biography of Bishop McElvain came out recently. I haven't read it yet, but it's on my stack. Early services for St. Paul's were held in a large rented room on the third floor of the Seneca block, of which, unfortunately, no image remains. Cleveland then had a population of about, any guesses? 12,000. And there were 18 churches in the uh, city, including two Jewish temples, two Catholic churches, and three Episcopal churches, Trinity, Grace, and St. John's, and then, of course, St. Paul's joining that proud number. The early parish thrived, and Dr. Perry wrote in an 1847 uh, report that, quote, our assemblies are very respectable as to numbers and intelligence, unquote. <laughs> Something that hasn't changed. Our first timber church was nearly completed at Sheriff, now East 4th Street on Euclid, but burned down on the night of August 3rd, 1849, just 10 days before completion. Arson through use of some kind of incendiary device was suspected. The fire might have been put out sooner, but rival private fire companies, as one was not uncommon in those days, argued upon a rival over who would get to fight the blaze and thus be paid for the job. By the time they worked it out, or brawled it out, the building was a total loss. The vestry, unfortunately, had no insurance, a mistake we would not make again. <laughs> Dr. Perry said, our faith is tried, but not exhausted. The vestry and parishioners rallied to collect funds for a new building, and other non-Episcopal churches in Cleveland, including the Presbyterians and the Baptists, donated generously. There's no known image of that first prematurely lost wooden St. Paul's Church. A new brick church was built on the same site, I'm reminded, of course, of the three little pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Our 1851 church, which cost uh, $22,000, is some not fully paid until seven years later. It was the first church in which the people of St. Paul's Parish actually met. Designed by Charles W. Hurd, it was a small structure in the Gothic Revival style. The bell tower, completed in 1858, gave St. Paul's the tallest spire in Cleveland. When a new parish room was eventually built 20 years later, the 1851 building, unfortunately, was demolished as a condition of the sale of the lot on which it stood. Little thought seems to have been given at the time in historic preservation. Instead, the thinking was, as Perkins wrote in her 1918 uh, uh, text, that, quote, nothing is more pathetic than an old church after, it's used, after it served its congregation for many years to be abandoned and then used as a noisy factory or a garage or for any commercial purpose. <laughs> Such an act is a public disgrace to the congregation." Unquote. So the thinking at the time was, tear it down. 
Fortunately, St. James in Painesville was also designed by Hurd, and it's very similar to the design to the 1851 building, and it still stands. Next time you're out in Painesville, have a look. Some of us from the Architectural Tour Guide group had the pleasure of touring it a few years ago, and it's a nice little step back in time if you'd like to try that. They are in the process of trying to renovate their kitchen, if anyone wants to donate. <laughs> All right, so they appreciate that. Episcopalians should help other Episcopalians, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> a major difference in parish management back then was that pew spaces were rented. This raised much-needed funds. The rental of pews for the second St. Paul's, for instance, raised $2,800. Very good money in those days. Renting pews assured habit-prone worshipers of getting the same seat Sunday after Sunday. Of course, those feelings are not creatures of habit. We all know that. And it also, no doubt, underscored the pecking order of St. Paul's better families, as they would think of themselves. Pew rental was not discontinued by order of the parish until, any guesses? 1928. St. Paul's was one of the first Episcopal churches in the diocese to permit women to vote in the annual parish meeting. This was at the initiative of the Reverend Frederick Brooks, our fifth rector after whom the Brooks Room is named. And we did that in 1869, some 51 years before the 19th Amendment gave votes to women in elections, federal and state elections, that is. It was not until the 1940s, though, that another important step was taken in the life of the parish, the introduction of coffee hour. <laughs> A recurring issue in the history of both the diocese and the parish was the tension between high church and low church approaches to worship. St. Paul's was founded, it might surprise you to know, as a low church in contrast to Trinity and Grace parishes. Early Ohio Episcopalians had what now seems to us uh, somewhat quaint, a near pathological fear of popish or Romish frippery. <laughs> Smells and bells, as some would say. <laughs> and church decor and liturgy were extremely Spartan for many years in most churches in Ohio. One early rector candidate assured the vestry, there's no tension, intention on my part of introducing any alien features from Latin sources into worship. <laughs> Another said firmly, there is no place at St. Paul's for Romish playthings and trinkets. <laughs> We've moved away from that a little bit. It was not until well into the Oxford movement of the 1840s that more elaborate worship spaces and services became more acceptable among all high Episcopalians, but there were considerable variations. Even so, it was not until 1964, the year it might surprise you to know when I was born, that special Eucharistic vestments were first used at St. Paul's. Never had been before that. Was there any connection? <laughs> I'll have to research that. Again. In keeping with the steady growth of the city and the eastward movement of parishioners, and after considerable discussion, the vestry decided to move east. The 1876 church was built, and we left our 1851 building. The parish thus made the first of several moves east, following population growth and the expansion of the city. This church was on the celebrated Millionaire's Row, the church of Cleveland's social and business elite, and was over the years the site of two weddings attended by the President of the United States. It was built in the Victorian Gothic style, designed by Detroit architect Gordon W. Lloyd. The first service was Christmas Eve, 1876, although the building was still not entirely done at that point. The church was finally completed and fully consecrated February 1st, 1877. The bells for the tower were donated by Jeff the Wade, not a parishioner, but a neighbor and founder of Western Union, supposedly on the condition that they never be rung during his lifetime. <laughs> As my dad would say in the deed of gift, what the large print giveth, the small print taketh away. <laughs> but they were rung for President James A. Garfield's death in September 1881, when all the bells of the city tolled during the night. In time, we outgrew this church and decided again to move further east, so the 1876 church was sold to the Roman Catholic Diocese in 1930 and still stands as the shrine of the conversion of St. Paul, an ecclesiastical joke of sorts. <laughs> the poor Clare Sisters of Perpetual Adoration, a monastic order of nuns, still remains there. The 10th rector, the Reverend Dr. Walter Breed, and Vestry drew up ambitious plans for the 1928 church in Cleveland Heights, our current parish home, continuing the trend of moving eastward with the more well-heeled members of the parish. The new church, our present parish home, was and still is an impressive edifice. How many diocesan seals are embedded in this church? <laughs> there are three. One on either side in the nave as you face the, uh, the altar, and another in the rector's office. Supposedly because Dr. Breed wanted St. Paul's to become the new cathedral. Oh. The 
bishop at the time had other ideas, however. And the cathedra, or bishop seat, has remained firmly in place at Trinity Cathedral downtown. Phase one of the new structure was what we now call Tucker Hall, our large gathering space and community hall, but for more than two decades, the principal worship space of the parish. The church was built halfway between two existing Episcopal parishes, St. Martin's and St. Albans. You can see it's the, uh, uh, the little board there for mounting of uh, the hymnal uh, numbers. And you see the choir up in the uh, upper right uh, gallery there. The church, as I said, was built halfway between two existing Episcopal parishes. By that point, St. Martin's and St. Albans. They were not, to put it mildly, pleased. And St. Albans in particular complained loudly to the bishop, although the conflict was eventually resolved to St. Paul's advantage. St. Paul's merger with St. Martin's, which was significantly smaller, is commemorated by the chapel, which still bears the latter's name. The architect of the new church was J. Byers Hayes of the famous firm of Walker and Weeks, who also designed the similar Baptist church, First Baptist Church, at Fairmount and Eden. It's of English Gothic style and built of Indiana limestone. The original plans were more elaborate, but the Great Depression and World War II intervened. The nave, the current worship space of the parish, was built with a temporary roof in 1943, up to the level of the current internal arches, and not completed until 1951. As many of you know, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King spoke here in May 1963. Pete Scriven, among others. Where's Pete? Was there? Since the establishment yeah. of St. Paul's, sorry? I was there. And you were too? Excellent. Anybody else? I shouldn't have uh, assumed. Very good. Nancy was here. A great day for the parish. There you go. Since the establishment of St. Paul's, clergy and lay members of this parish have played important roles in diocesan affairs. Even now, Bill Powell is canon to the ordinary or chief of staff to the bishop. Tom Austin is treasurer of the diocese, and others from St. Paul's serve important roles in diocesan leadership across northern Ohio. We're pleased and honored to have the bishop's family regularly worship with us. St. Paul's has for some years now been the largest parish in the diocese, the so-called Carmel Parish, and there's every reason to expect that we'll continue to help lead, sustain, and nurture the Diocese of Ohio. Bishop Hollingsworth, our 11th Bishop Diocesan, and Bicentennial organizers ask every parish to submit a prayer for ministry for the next 200 years and beyond. The prayers are to be published in a booklet that will be used in conjunction with the diocesan cycle of prayer this year and beyond. Our curate, the Reverend Dale Granfield, wrote this beautiful prayer, which will be included in the booklet. Let us pray. Risen Lord, you made yourself known to the Apostle Paul in a flash of light and called him from a life of zeal to follow you in spreading your comforting good news to all people everywhere. As the Episcopal Parish of as the Episcopal Diocese of Ohio sets forth into its third century, reveal yourself to us as a parish and a diocese. Convert us, direct our zeal, and call us to be yours. Let our hearts and minds be one in love of you. Challenge us with the gifts of your spirit in the work of ministry. Stir up in us a willingness to leave behind whatever binds us in order to proclaim your good news to the world. Let us always be aware to the wideness of your mercy and commission us in your grace, not counting the cost, to be vibrant witnesses of your love in our neighborhood and throughout the world. All we, this we ask for your love's sake. Amen. 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 Members of the diocese, as Rich mentioned, have been particularly encouraged this year to do something blessed and good with a 200 hook. Volunteer 200 hours to the Act 2 shop. Buy 200 pencils for Roxborough Elementary. Donate $200 to the Episcopal Relief and Development Fund, or whatever you wish. The diocese is collecting reports of all these 200 projects, Several parishioners have already submitted personal 200 theme pledges to me. It's not too late <laughs> if you want to do the same. Just let me know. Bishop Gregory T. Bedell, at the 1877 dedication of St. Paul's Second Home, said, Memories are sacred, but even the saintliest must only give fresh impulse to Christian faith and labor. Nothing in the past history of this church is now to be rem remembered except as an incentive to higher endeavor. Gratias Deo. Thanks be to God. These words, I suggest to you, are just as true today. My hope and prayer is that we all may have a happy, faith-filled bicentennial here in St. Paul's, our parish home, and across northern Ohio. Long may, be we, long may we be worthy of our church and do our best to pass along both it and our diocese, even better than we found them, to those who follow us in years to come. Thank you.